Greetings, good afternoon, and welcome to the critically acclaimed, because I decided it was called critically acclaimed, The Fucked Up Man with my good brother, John Pierre de Villiers, aka JP. How are you, my man? I am awesome, man. Glad to be here. Very good to have you here, brother. Very good to have you here. I, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I'm going to tell everybody in advance that this particular interview for me is. You know, there's certain times you interview someone, if you interview people and do podcasts regularly, where you are asking questions for the benefit of the viewer. I'm not going to lie, I'm asking questions today for me. I'm just putting it out there. I'm just, I'm telling you, I'm going to make pages of notes in this interview. This interview is just for me. So, um, brother, where do I start? Like, I've got so much that I want to talk to you about. There's so much wisdom that I know that uh, people are going to get from you in this, um, in this episode today. The first place I want to start is, um, and I'm just going to kind of cut straight to the heart of the matter because yep. the whole point of this show is, which you said you love the title, is about being really vulnerable and being really honest with yourself about the fact that we're not perfect. And I feel that in today's society, it's never been more important, especially for masculine um, alpha energy to have the courage to admit that they're a little bit fucked up, they're not perfect. They have emotions, they have feelings, and that if they don't uh, deal with those things that are maybe behind closed doors, behind their eyes, it's a bit like keeping your finger on a kettle that's already already boiled. So mm. I want to go straight in and talk about something that I know is um, a lot of people will know about and a lot of people might not, which is your accident. If you'd be willing, I'd love to kind of go there and just talk about um, what happened and Really, what I really want to uh, I want to help people understand in this interview is how this incredible man processes challenges that most of us are probably never going to even go through and how he's able to process and come out. I think you want to pay attention, not just those of you that watch, you want to pay attention not just to what he says, but just his energy and how he genuinely lives and breathes this incredible message. So, bro, tell us about it and what happened and, and how you've how you've come through that. Thank you, bro. Thanks for having me here. Uh, thanks for doing this podcast. As we said before we went live, what a great, I'm going to use a word that is relative <laughs> to this conversation. What a great fucking t title. And, you know, I said to Miles before we went live that, you know, this gives not only shares with people that it's okay to not be okay especially men but also it gives people permission or men permission to share that they are fucked up and i said to miles i'm at the front of that queue baby <laughs> like all of my students and clients know i never claim to be at the top of the mountain saying pay me loads of money and i'll show you how to get to the top i'm just like i'm climbing the mountain and I can help you climb your mountain and at least be your guide. Because if you've come to me, it's because something, uh, something about where you are, you feel I'm ahead of you. Mm -hmm. So let's just be clear on that. I always say to my clients, I'm not at the top of the mountain, but I can guide you to the next level. Mm -hmm. And that's because I'm still figuring out my, my own stuff. I don't know what kind of language I can use, Miles. I should have probably asked you, you before. Whatever. There's a parent advisory label in the logo, aka you can say whatever the fuck you like, brother. Okay, awesome. So I'm still figuring out my own shit. And I still have demons. I still have gremlins from my past. I have limiting beliefs. I think everyone has some form of limiting belief. Mm -hmm. And all that really is, is a block to your next level. I don't think you get rid of your limiting beliefs and you go from here to here. Life doesn't work like that. Life is about going from here to here to here to here, like playing Donkey Kong or Super Mario. You just mm -hmm. focus on the next level. Yes. And once you've figured out the next level, then you focus at the next level and the next level and the next level. So I'm just at a level. I'm at a very high level but I've got many more levels to go. And based on all the work that I've been doing for 18 years of my life, since I first started coaching myself at the age of 23, turning 40 this year, I just worked on levels for me. That's it. It was selfish. It was self-full. I didn't know I was going to be a coach or a speaker. 
But when I became fully engaged in the work of self-growth, personal development, self-mastery, and personal leadership, I was able to lead and master myself level by level by level by level. And because I knew that this could be an asset and of value to others, I decided at the age of 25 to make it my career because I knew it, it had value, it had so much value to me in my life. I knew it could help other people. And I never I didn't care about, oh, I want to change the whole world. If I could just help a few people, those people could potentially go out and change the world because well, it's just transferable energy, right? We create energy for others, and then those people create energy for other people. So I've been doing this now for 18 years, 16 years professionally as a paid coach, speaker, athlete, author, and, and, and personal trainer. It's been a journey. And I'm so grateful, so, so grateful to myself, to God, to the, the universe, Mother Nature, that I have been on this journey that I've been on because in May 2029, the 22nd of May, I was put in a position in my life, not by choice, but by force, to have to use every tool that I'd ever invested in, in learning, discovering, and implementing in my life when I was faced with my own mortality. I was coaching and speaking, and I just released my fifth book, and I was doing something that I love to do, Miles, which is charity events through fitness challenges or charity causes, charitable causes through fitness challenges. And I was cycling from the north of Scotland to the south of England, 1,000 miles in 10 days. And on the eighth day, I was hit going downhill head on by a drunk four times over the limit, un uninsured, disqualified driver, not even driving his own car in a hit and run accident, flown off the road, bike smashed to peaches, uh, pieces, to peaches. Yeah, that would be, that'd have been nice. <laughs> yeah, that would have been awesome, yeah. Been and literally, literally left for dead. And I was so grateful that a car, the gentleman kept on driving, he's now in prison uh, with a smashed windscreen and someone came towards him, thought that's weird. The whole car is smashed in, but they couldn't even see the driver behind the car. That's how smashed the windscreen was and from my head and my body. And then they saw my bike and they stopped. And eventually they heard me screaming. I don't remember any of this. I have post-traumatic amnesia. It was so traumatic that the brain says, fuck you. You're not going to remember any of this. Thank you, God, again. Yeah. And uh, because it would have been a very different experience if I remembered everything. And I was found down a bank Apparently, the police officer said, handling my case, that if I had gone a little bit further, I potentially would have fallen down the, the edge because it's a very um, steep hill and I would have gone down whatever. I wouldn't have been here. Let's just say that. And what happened was, was after day 10 or day 11, when the amnesia wasn't there anymore and I started to actually realize, because I was conscious apparently the whole time. Throughout going into surgeries, I went into multiple surgeries, bowel, arm. I've got metal work in my legs. But day 10, day 11 in intensive care, I started to really piece together what had happened to me. And because of everything that I just shared, the work that I've been doing for so long, the first thing that I knew I had to do as I lay there and became conscious of my experience, I knew that there was no meaning to this experience until I chose to gave it the meaning. Yes. One cho chose to give it the meaning. And I decided in that moment that this didn't happen to me. This happened for me. And, I, you know, you people can say, oh, he's bullshitting some personal development fucking um, inspirational story. It's the truth. Whether you believe me or not, I don't give a shit. I'm not here to please you. I've been, you know, I've done all the work in pleasing me. So I don't need anyone's validation or approval. But I just knew that this moment in my life can define my future. Or I can use this to create a powerful future. Yes. And, and too many people suffer as a result of trauma, heartbreak, breakdown, um, you know, losing people in their life. I just had too much awareness that I could not ignore it. Mm -hmm. And I knew that this was going to be the making of me and not the breaking of me. And every day I told myself, your recovery is not about you, JP. This recovery is not about you. And that's why, you know, I'm so grateful, bro. You came and visited me in hospital and you I were just, just going to vouch. I was just going to vouch for the RoboCop stitches 
the week after in hospital. Yeah, these stitches were real. There was metal everywhere. He was drugged up on morphine. I don't think he <laughs> remembered that I visited. It was no, it was, I remember, man. Yeah, I remember. yeah, yeah. But I, but I also remember that day. I remember that even as morphined up as you were, I remember sharing a little joke, which was a joke, but with real truth to it, which was think of how many how many more people you're going to be able to touch and inspire mm. as a result of going through this and coming out the other side, like literally like in your own way, like Victor Frankl shit. Like I'm like going through an experience that's so challenging that you're going to that's come it. out and it really is going to be your own meaning, right? That's the book. Yeah, That man. is the book yeah, yeah, that yeah. I recommend number one to yeah, everyone because yeah. yeah. I read that in my late 20s. Yeah. And I thought if a, if a fucking Jew in yeah. concentration camps, including yeah. Auschwitz, having yeah. to sit in queues where yeah. they're going left, right, left, right, you're alive, you're going to die, you're alive, you're going to die, watching people eat themselves, watching pieces of skin missing from piles of bodies. And he's saying, even in this, you can choose what this means. That fucking blew me away. And it just, I through my 30s, I just kept creating more powerful meanings. Nope, that is not my life. This is what I how I create my life. Oh, this happened to me. Oh, it's fine. It's just an experience. I'm gonna use my own meaning. And it just it was easy for me. It just was because I've been practicing it for so long, and whatever we practice, we get good at. And I just I woke up and I never blamed the driver, I never blamed myself. I just said your recovery is not for you. It's for others. Mm -hmm. And also an extension of that or a deeper way of saying that is to every fucked up person watching this or every person that's ever been fucked up or gone mm -hmm. through something fucked up. Mm -hmm. I can say those words because it's the title of this bloody podcast. <laughs> is very important, including you, Miles, whatever you've mm -hmm. been through. Your story happened to you, but it, it didn't happen for you. Your story happened to you so that you could give it to others. And that's all I've done my whole life, man. I don't claim to have nailed life, but I'm doing my best. Yeah. And as long as I can keep putting myself through experiences and sharing it with others, and I do it from the right place with the right intention, then I know it's going to touch other people, man. So, yeah, I'm just grateful to be here, dude. I'm grateful to be here. There's a really key thing that you said there about not, um, I can't remember the exact wording, forgive me for not paraphrasing, but not holding onto blame, judgment, ill feeling, anger towards yeah. the driver. Um, how do you do that when, I mean, I know speaking from my experience and being really transparent, there's times where I judge, blame, feel anger sometimes towards other people who have not, knocked me over on a fucking bike they just maybe said something that kind of is i've allowed to emotionally trigger me right and i'm sure there's a lot of people watching that if they're really honest they can admit that too she said this mm. he said that how does a person how do they stop judging blaming the the anger for things that if they're really honest in a lot of cases are nowhere near what you've been through how mm. How do they do that? So first of all, you've got to you've got to know that not blaming someone for where you are isn't not holding them accountable or responsible. That's not what I mean. The driver obviously was responsible. If someone did wrong to you in your life, they're responsible for what they did what they did. But you cannot blame that person for what you feel. Mm -hmm. And I say this with so much respect to anyone watching or listening to this that has been through abuse, trauma, anything that has traumatized you. I'm not mm -hmm. saying don't hold that person or that experience accountable or responsible. I'm just saying that all creation starts with thought. Nothing in the world was ever created without consciousness, without thought. This bottle, my cup, me, this microphone, everything is created by thought. So 
if everything created on the outside is created on the inside, mm -hmm. how can I blame someone else for how I'm feeling? Because how we feel is then how we behave, how we act, uh, the results that we get. So it's always life mastery or day mastery or moment mastery is always inside out rather than outside in. Does that make sense? Yes. So I knew that in everyone's intention in life, in business, pursuing fitness goals, doing anything, the reason why everyone does what they do is because they're chasing the feeling of feeling good. Mm -hmm. Everyone that I've ever worked with in my life, from CEO to student to uh, leadership teams to athletes, everyone, if I ask them, why do you want that goal? What would that mean to you? How would that make you feel? And I keep asking, asking. The end result is always, it'll make me feel good or it'll make me happy. And no amount of blaming will make you feel good. No amount of blaming will make you happy. So when you reflect on this idea that everything that I want to create starts from within, and the ultimate purpose of life is to feel good or be happy, it means that I have to create a happy, feeling good environment for me to experience it on the outside. So I had known this already for the last few years. So when I woke up in hospital, I knew unconsciously already, or was already, I already trained and conditioned my conscious mind. Mm -hmm. But my unconscious knew there is no amount of blaming the driver that will benefit my situation right now, not even to a degree. So to anyone else that's feeling like, oh, I can't forgive, oh, I can't let go, I'm telling you now that the only thing that's doing for you by holding on to that is making you feel worse and worse and worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And if the goal in life to not just survive but to thrive is to feel good, you've got to be mm -hmm. able to lift yourself up and free yourself from the things that are holding you down. Yeah. Every single thing that you hold on to, which is a choice, emotional and mental, everything that you hold on to emotionally or mentally that, that you choose to hold on to adds a weight and another weight and another weight until eventually you're trying to swim and you're being pulled down by an anchor attached to your ankle. Mm -hmm. And it becomes heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. And eventually it becomes your identity because you start to sink. And there's nothing else you can do. And maybe you give up. Maybe you give up on your dreams. Maybe you give up on your goals. Maybe you give up on being the best version of yourself. So in short, understand that you just want to feel good. Or just remind yourself that you just want to feel good. You don't need to understand that. It's pretty simple. And number two, know that no amount of blaming can make you feel good. If the end goal in life is to feel good, and no amount of blaming will make you feel good. Try and tell me when blaming someone has made your heart feel healed or whole or mm. fuller. Mm. Then why do it? Yeah. yeah. Why do it? It's To be honest, it, if we find ourselves, oh, no, we want mm. to blame, and I want to justify why you're an asshole, Miles, mm. is because it makes me feel better about me. Yes. And that's ego. Yes. Blaming someone, even if they've done something wrong, makes us feel better about ourselves. But the consequence of blaming someone else for what happened at work or what happened at home is, yes, we put ourselves up. But if everyone just wants to be equal in life, and I'm all for that, everyone is the same, love and unity. By us blaming others and putting ourselves up or one-upping ourselves, what's the expense of us? of that someone else is now one level lower you cannot you cannot blame make yourself feel better for blaming this person for what they did to you at the ex at, at no expense there has to be some kind of expense there yes yes anyway so i'm i'm talking too much man <laughs> no, no no you're not you you just you, you've reminded me of um uh, was it nelson mandela who said holding on to negative emotion is like drinking poison and hoping it will kill your enemy, it doesn't work. 
Having anger and resentment is like drinking poison and expecting it to kill your enemy. Yeah. I'll give you another Nelson Mandela quote on forgiveness. Mm -hmm. By the way, he's my greatest hero. And he has been since I was a teenager. Ever, when I grew up in Cape Town, South Africa, even as a child, I was meant to do this work, Miles, this self-discovery work. Because even as a child, in a whites only whites only school, where only like as I was going into high school, there was one African person in my school, and it was very strange. I was obsessed with the president, and I was thinking, how does a man come out of prison of 27 years and become the leader of his country? Yeah. And one of the things that he shared was. When asked when he got put on stage, he, you know, he did he, he got his presidency and he stood on stage with the white leaders like F. W. de Klerk, the former president, and they were going to work together. And a reporter asked him, "How can you not hate the people that put you in prison?" And he said, "Well, simply, if I chose to hate them, I'd still be in prison because prison is created in your mind like everything else." Yes. And I'll never forget that when I heard that. Hating someone is putting yourself in prison. Having anger, resentment is literally putting a cage around your mind. Yes. And I don't know. No human being wants to be imprisoned. Every human being. Look, I'll say I'm plant based plug. Here's a cheeky plug for veganism. No <laughs> being wants to be caged. Yeah. Everyone just wants to be free. And a path to freedom is letting go of everything that doesn't serve you so that you can be free in your full expression in, in your values, living on your terms and, and be, be light, be light in love, in life. Speaking of light, um, I saw something on your, on your page. I was scrolling through yesterday and today um, and you talked about not, you, you really, there's a message that I've seen several posts about not taking life too seriously. Um, I've been watching a video for the past two weeks of a man in New Zealand who got married. He had a brain tumor and he died the day after he got married. I'm watching it every morning, first thing in the morning before I get on the spin bike to immediately just remind myself every morning of the fucking often overused cliche of life is short, right? Mm. But the reason I'm doing it is to really really like no life really is short right don't take it too seriously so in this climate that we're currently in which is understandable for people to feel serious about you know people losing their lives in um in the thousands how does a person in this particular climate how do they take themselves more lightly how do they take themselves less seriously how do they do that so it, it sounds very simple, but it is gratitude. I'll elaborate and I'll, I'll go deeper on that, but it's being grateful for what you have. Um, COVID cannot let us down. Life cannot let us down. Your relationship cannot let you down. The only thing that can let us down in life is our expectation of how we believe our life should be. Let go of expectation, trade it for appreciation. And when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. There's some Wayne Dyer coaching there. That, that, was, like, that was like a Tony Wayne wrap off there. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got many great teachers. Or I've had many, many great teachers in my life. And um, yeah, just tra trade your expectations for appreciation. So that's the simple answer. And just to elaborate on that a little bit, your life can be over, not just before you think it'll be over, but it can be over even before you know it's over. Let me explain. I was cycling across the UK, l living my best life. I mean, if you watched my videos from when I was on that challenge, I was just like a kid in passion, on purpose, full of energy, vitality, love for life, gratitude. I mean, I had it all in that moment. I had it all. And then I was in hospital saying, or oh, being told, JP, you've been in an accident. You were hit by a car. Doctors saying you're very lucky to be alive. You obviously have a very strong mindset. Um, you're lucky you're so healthy and fit. What I'm getting at here is 
I, I wasn't given a warning. I didn't have a notice period. If I was going in whatever, one inch, in, I was one inch to the left or to the right, definitely, if I wasn't wearing a helmet, I would not be having this conversation with you. I would have, at 37 years old, that would have been my legacy. And you maybe would today, Miles, be having a conversation with one of our brothers or sisters that we, you know, that we're mutual friends with, talking about JP and the short life that he lived, but the impactful life that he lived. It's such a shame that most human beings need death to be reminded of life, but it is a gift. Yes. And you know, almost you got to. I said to someone this morning, be careful what you wish for. Because in my 18 years of research and self-discovery and knowledge, you know, just consuming as much knowledge as I can, I almost became a bit jealous of people with near-death experiences because of how it changed their life so much. And it really was a gift. And the gift that it gave me was to never go too fast in life that you forget to take out the joy from every moment wow. because nothing is ever expected. And what I had done, even though I said I was living the great life, I was, you know, great. Like, once again, I wasn't perfect, but from the outside, you'd think, fucking hell, man, this guy coming from poor background, bullied in school, not much to live for. Mm -hmm. My, my whole mentality growing up was get out of school so you can stop being bullied, get a job, pay your bills until you retire. That was what I believe life was mm -hmm. to then, you know, having spoken in 17 countries, written five books, represent Tony Robbins, success resources, uh, blah, 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 blah. Work with Lisa Nichols as my coach. And now as my friend and, um, to have that. And then all of a sudden have it all almost taken away. It made me really reflect on my life. And I lay in hospital for seven weeks, one of those weeks which you came to visit me. And one of the things I reflected on was, what could I do better? What could I do better? And I'd realized that I had created a life for myself where I was living in a bullet train. And the bullet train was heading in the right direction. There was still some, you know, stopping and starting. And then back to full speed every time it had to stop or slow down. I was mixing in first class, wearing my tailored suits with my Breitling watch and on social media, on the Wi-Fi and the train and mixing with celebs and all these things. But I was going so fucking fast on the train that not only could I not see what was going on outside the window, but I wasn't even taking the time to look. Mm. And having that accident made me realize that your train can come to a dead end stop as in a head on collision at any moment. So what would I do differently now that I know this, now that I know life is so temporary, it's keep looking out the window, look out the window and take in everything that you can. And my definition of success only as a result of going through that experience and meditating for over 300 hours since my accident, Mm -hmm. is that true richness and wealth in life is not attainment or materials. It's the ability to absorb everything that you can from each and every moment of your life. Because who will die wealthier? The person that absorbed every moment, every minute, every second from the last hour of their life or the other person that was just focused on future goals and having more money? So that's my answer. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's funny. It, it truly feels like that is the end of this episode. Like, I, you know, it'd be very easy to just, you know, I'm, 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 I've often myself been in this trap in the past of acquiring more knowledge, of, of wanting to obtain more for the sake of something that I think it's going to give me. And I feel like you've given us so much in half an hour that if people just reflect on what you've just said, that, that would be enough. And just to be clear, your question was, what do you do for people, you know, in the time that we're in right now and um, having to deal with what we're going through? It's just, don't expect your life to be any other way. Mm. 
Yes. Like we, we, we can choose the meaning of why is this happening to us? Yes. Or you could choose, even if you have to lie to yourself, mm -hmm. choose the meaning of why not? Yes. Why not? Who, who are we to say that we should not be experiencing this heartache right now, this failure right now, this disruption? Who mm -hmm. are we? We're not the fucking, okay, obviously we create our universe from inside out and all that, but we don't control the whole bloody universe. We can yeah. influence it. We can influence our universe. But there's so many things that are out of our control. And as soon as you try to control what's out of your control, you create suffering in your life. I've studied a lot of Buddhism. I'm not religious, but if I was to be, I would be Buddhist. Yes. And in Buddhism, the number one thing in the Buddhist teachings is that suffering exists. The second thing in Buddhism to understand is that all people create their own suffering. Suffering exists, it's mm -hmm. real, and you create your own suffering. And then it's our obligation to make sure that we're removing as much suffering from our life as possible. Unless it's like, when I say suffering, I mean things that don't make you feel good because we just want to feel good. Yeah. We just want to feel good. Mm. And if we're holding on to things like expectation and anger and resentment and judgment and fear, anything that is low frequency, we are creating our own suffering. And no mm. one can ever make you feel anything until you choose to have that be your reality. So I say, I say to life, fucking bring it on, man. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying you're not going to cry. I'm not saying you're not going to be depressed. I'm not saying you, you know, I won't be suicidal in my life or anyone else here. But how we deal with these experiences is 100% our choice and our responsibility. And therefore, in these times of difficulty, disruption, discomfort, do not go at it alone. Because once again, suffering exists and we create our own suffering. And no amount of saying, no, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this, when you're going through a hard time, will remove suffering from your life. Mm -hmm. This is why like, I love this podcast. I love sharing. I love doing interviews, et cetera, because one of my mentors shared something amazing, and I just agree with this so much. If you're doing it alone, you're doing it wrong. If you're doing business alone, you're doing it wrong. If you're going through your recovery alone, you're doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. If you're doing life alone, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Even individual sport is a team sport, right? Well, yeah, no. Look at look at an individual sport like Lewis Hamilton. With you a think team of what? I don't know how many are in the 300 team. Three hundred people. Three hundred people. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, we got to keep going together and growing together. Amazing. And you know that's why I support you for doing this this podcast, man, because this allows people to get out of their own suffering, and that's all I want. I couldn't really care about much else. Of course, I care about my family and love and being in love and being in love with life. But what I want to stand for is at the end of my life, whether it's going to be one year from now, because I'm going to keep doing more challenges. I have another one coming up at the end of this month yeah. or whether it's going to be a hundred years from now. I just want people to know that what I stood for was truth and that in me being truthful, intentional and authentic that i can just help people to stop suffering because suffering is not a natural state it's created by either ourselves or our role models or lack thereof or our experiences of intensity or experiences of trauma but we all have the right to be free and freedom starts from within freedom and life mastery is an inside out game not the other way around. And if you haven't read the book that I referred to before, Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankel, do yourself and your life a favor. Read that book. Because regardless of what you've been through in your life, it'll really make you think hard about am I, being, am I choosing to be a victim here mm -hmm. or am I choosing my own meaning consciously and responsibly?
Namaste, brother. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you very much. Amazing. Great to have you here. How do people um, who will inevitably want to contact you, reach out, stay in touch with you, how should they do that after the podcast? Social media. I'm, I'm, I'm not on it all the time. I would say my number one goal this year is just trying to get on top of everyone's messages. That's like my number one personal goal. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I can't promise that I'll get back to everyone, but I do my very best to to connect with people wherever I can. And, you know, I have a small team and we stay on top of social media and emails and stuff like that. And just uh, the sounds very... Uh, egoic just type my name into google and you'll find whatever you need to find linkedin facebook uh instagram uh i don't know um yeah whatever platform they use they'll find you yeah exactly yeah, yeah. If, if you find me it was meant to be there you go That's there's me there's cre me creating more meaning Love that. If if you don't connect with me, it wasn't meant to be. <laughs> it's me. It's me, for being here, brother. it's me taking the pressure off myself. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I like it. Thanks for being here, my man. Cheers, man. Absolutely. Namaste. Love you. Peace and love.